Dynasty won't be seen tonight, so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to The Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about G.I. Joe. Joe. American oh, man, hero. I... It's always amazing when we start singing and I realize I can't sing at all. Go, Joe! You can sing, actually. I can't. You can. You have a beautiful voice. I can't carry tune. You can do the high parts really well. Oh, thanks, man. You do. We just need to harmonize. (laughs) Maybe if we practice for (laughs) two seconds. Yeah. G.I. Joe! Yeah, Yeah. baby! Go, Joe! I'm about G.I. Joe. It's going to be an interesting episode because you you played with the early ones and I played with the later ones. Yeah, I got some interesting... uh, Memories about those old Joes and <laughs> how they were uh, disposed of. Um, Fun. Yeah. No, G.I. Joe is – it is amazing because up until then, boys didn't play with dolls. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and according to my stepdad, boys shouldn't play with dolls at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, but – A lot of stepdads back in the day felt that way. Action figures changed – the way kids play, oh, yeah. man. Yeah. Action figures. You're not dolls. I, I, if I had a nickel for every time I said, they're not dolls, they're action figures. My guys are action figures. I'd, I'd be super rich right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it t- completely changed the way we play. Yeah. Because yeah. kids could, you know, boys before it was all like sports and guns and, mm-hmm. you know, roughhousing and stuff, which is great. Yeah. But I think getting... These little guys, especially, at least for me, you know, and yeah. this was mostly my Star Wars guys, but you opened up your imagination, you created adventures, and you yeah. created, you know, all these different scenarios for you guys, and I think it was really great, <laughs> you know, it, of course it's a war thing, but uh, uh, it, that's how yeah. it has to be, yeah. boys like guns and and. Army I, guys and all that stuff. Yeah, but I didn't. I didn't focus on the war part of it. Like I, part of the reason that I came to L.A. and came to Hollywood was because I created stories for my GI Joe figures. Sure, like it. It was. I was eight, nine years old, and I was creating these long, elaborate stories to the point where my brother would literally stop playing with me. Well, yeah, <laughs> because, because he was like, "This is too complicated." Well, all of your GI Joes were part of the USO, and they had to put on this show, and it, no, there it was, was so much backstage infighting. It was just in a lot scenarios. of a lot of guys in jeeps driving away from the fight. <laughs> <laughs> my brother'd be like, "What are you doing?" I was, yeah. But it was great. I mean, that was it, it. It sparked my imagination. I I didn't focus as much on the war part. I mean, obviously they were, and they would. It's really about good and evil and fighting bad guys and all that. Well, the but. original, the Joe that I had, the thing that was so much fun were these action packs. You know, you get like the scuba guy action. Pack. Yeah, it was yeah. like it was basically. I, I know we'll get into it, but it's basically like the same thing as the Barbie accessory pack. Yeah, but it had guns yeah. and flippers and stuff. It just was much more boy-oriented. And tents and weird vehicles and all sorts oh, yeah. of stuff. I mean, yeah. it was really a really quality product. Yeah, it was. It was. Well, take yourself back, 1964, May 12th, 12 young men in New York City publicly burned their draft cards to protest the Vietnam War, the first such act of war resistance. Yeah, that was brave, man. 1964, way sooner than I thought it happened. Yeah. Like, I thought it happened much later in the 60s. August 7th, the United States Congress passes the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, giving U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson broad war powers to deal with North Vietnamese attacks on U.S. forces. I feel like I should have been doing the, dun-dum, 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 the, the JFK Oliver Stone. <laughs> and then the Vietnam War took over. <laughs> <laughs> December 11th, Che Guevara addresses the United Nations General Assembly. A bazooka attack is launched at the headquarters of the United Nations in New York City. Go, Joe! Yeah, it's, <laughs> the fact that it's specified it being a bazooka is really funny. Yeah, man. Well, that's a serious attack. That is. Bazookas do damage. They do. Them. They do. You ever, especially Bazooka Joe. You ever try to chew that gum, man? Oh, my God. Cut your mouth up like nobody's... Break your teeth. Yeah, it's like uh, hard, chalky razor blades. Yeah. I always liked the comics that came with Bazooka Joe. Everybody did. And nobody got it for the gum. The little message at the bottom was, help, I'm trapped in a gum factory. Yeah. (laughs) So it's my favorite. Uh, At some point during 1964, G.I. Joe, America's movable fighting man is released. At some point. Uh, All records have been lost. I could not find any actual date of when it was released. Yeah. Uh, so G. Classified, Adam. Yeah. Classified. Apparently. Well, he's America's movable fighting man. <laughs> he is. 
G.I. Joe starts with Stanley Weston. He was an inventor. He in, he attended New York University before enlisting in the United States Army during the Korean War. He returned to New York City after the war and completed his master's degree at New York University. Shortly after completing his master's degree, Weston joined a relatively new emerging segment of the retail and entertainment industries known as licensing and merchandising. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> he became a licensing agent who oversaw branding negotiations for Soupy Sales and Twiggy during the 1960s. Yeah, they made these Twiggy dolls, you know, yeah. from the model, but they kept losing them because they just slipped through anything. They were so skinny. <laughs> and the Soupy Sales doll, ooh. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was Soupy. <laughs> Weston became interested in a possible military toy line from frequent trips to an Army-Navy surplus store in New York City, as well as the military articles in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh, here's Stanley Weston again coming into our Army surplus store. C- carrying oh. around his Encyclopedia hey, Britannica. He's taking notes. Never buys anything. <laughs> Either buy some or get out, Stanley. I'm sick of you. Uh, he'd be that guy in the corner reading the encyclopedia. It's, hmm. What's up with that guy? Joy at parties. Uh. Stanley, oh, Stanley Weston, if you weren't a good inventor. (laughs) Weston also scoured thrift stores for military uniforms and paraphernalia. Unlike most most toy lines, Weston created G.I. Joe without a backstory, specific enemy, or mission. Well, that seems kind of (laughs) lazy. Well, (laughs) yeah. Weston made rudimentary prototypes of the figure and basic marketing materials that showed the sales potential of a military action figure. You know where he found the... The inspiration for the figure was mm-hmm. the modeling figures. Yeah, that's what he used. Yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. went and bought a bunch of modeling yeah. figures from like a yeah, art the, store. like the life drawing figure yeah. things, little wooden guys. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, he he literally made his own uniforms and then dressed them up and then like painted faces on them and stuff and was like, look, these can sell. <laughs> yeah, I just see him with his little needle and thread and boom, <laughs> tiny little vests and making, oh, I got to double stitch this one. They're going to see all oh, my toys. They didn't, it wasn't named G.I. Joe then. It was, he just called them my army guys. Oh, yeah. well, my army guys are going to set the world on fire. He, he was the first person to create military stories with his weird army figures. Don't call them dolls. <laughs> when he showed these materials to Donald Levine, a Hasbro executive, Levine told Weston, You will make a fortune with these. Weston subsequently licensed the entire concept to Hasbro for $100,000. Yeah, they offered him fifty grand and 1% royalties on everything, or a $100,000 buyout. Well, he should have taken the one percent. Well, but yeah, I, it's always do you know easy. How, do you know what the sales were in 1989 of GI Joe? Yeah, they over were, two billion dollars. Yeah, his family would have been rich for the rest of their lives. But it's twenty. Sure. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Sure. hundred grand was a lot of money back then. I'm sure he did did a lot with it. Yeah, but it's just it's that oh, man. There's always just those. Uh, those I wedgy, know. those wedgy inducing, you know, where you're, you're just like, ooh, uh, the bad decision. I, I, it was 50 grand. I would have taken it with the 1%. Uh, but, you know. Yeah, well, you don't have a family, Adam. That's true. Maybe he had uh, some braces or something they had to get for probably, his kid. Probably, probably. The conventional marketing wisdom of the early 1960s was that boys would not play with dolls, or were not allowed to, and parents would not buy their son's dolls, which would have been traditionally a girl's toy. Ugh, I know. It's just so weird. It wasn't even that long ago, but it no. was just so, like, boys play with balls, and I, girls play yeah. with dolls, and that's the way it is, and that's the way it all shall be. This is this is what started the whole boys will be boys thing. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's awful. Thus, the word doll was never used by Hasbro or anyone involved in the development of marketing or marketing of G.I. Joe. Didn't they like uh, fine you if you use the word doll there? I don't know. That's possible. I think I, I think I heard that they they you had you had to pay a fine if you used doll instead of action. Whatever. <laughs> Action figure was the only acceptable term and has since become the generic description for any posable doll intended for boys. I know. How great would it be to be the guy that came up with action figure? And that's a really cool name, It is. Too. It works really well. It's good marketing, yeah. Hey, nobody wants to bore playing with a dolly, yeah. but an action figure. Well, it's just action figure is so... I mean, it's it. you're supposed to play with it. Like, it's, it's supposed very, to be played with. It 100% is... Uh, a good moniker because it is exactly what it is. Right. It's yeah. a figure made for action. It is true. America's movable fighting man. Is a registered trademark of Hasbro and was prominently displayed on every boxed figure package. The Hasbro prototypes were originally named Rocky, the Marine Soldier, Skip, the Sailor, and Ace, the Pilot. 
Nice. <laughs> Rocky Skip and Ace. <laughs> it sounds like they'd be in a gay club somewhere. <laughs> you know what? They are. <laughs> Before the u- more universal name G.I. Joe was adopted, they actually had individual names. One of the prototypes would later sell in a heritage auction in 2003 for $200,001. Ugh, that's that one guy who was like, $200,001. <laughs> And then the guy was like, uh, I can't do 200,002. That'll break me. <laughs> what a jerk. Uh, an African American figure was introduced in 1965, though it was simply the same face as the white figure painted brown. Mm. <laughs> Creative, guys. <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, it's, at least it's a little bit of progress. Yeah, and they're trying. They're trying. The initial product offering featured members of the four branches of the armed forces action soldier, action sailor, action pilot, and action marine. With accessory sets immediately available for each branch. Oh, that's the thing. The accessory sets were brilliant, man. Oh, yeah. Because you could get like tents, like bivouacs, you could get like uh, machine gun nests, mm-hmm. but you could also get like your frogman guy. Or your yeah. infiltrator guy, and he came with like a beanie and, right, and right. like a, a knife and stuff. And right. it was like you had all of these great outfits, and yet you didn't have any bad guys or anything to fight against. It was just I would basically grab my sister's Barbies and Kens, and they would kill them. <laughs> it was like I don't know what was going on there. <laughs> Some sort. I guess they were like. Uh, like that, uh, uh, the Americans, you know, I guess I found Barbie and Ken were like secret <laughs> Russian spies and I had to go in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rip all the heads off my sister's Barbies. Oh, she hated me. Ugh. Hated. Ugh. It was correctly assumed that competitors would try to emulate or outright copy the concept. So the idea was to offer a broad range of accessory items from the very start. Oh, and they did. Yeah, oh yeah. Aside from the obvious trademarking on the right buttock, other aspects of the figure were copyrighted features that allowed Hasbro to successfully pursue cases against producers of cheap imitations, since the human figure itself cannot be copyrighted or trademarked. Right. The scar on the right cheek was an example. Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah. Uh, Another, unintentional at first, was the placement of the right thumbnail on the underside of the thumb. Yeah, he was deformed. (laughs) He was. I'm surprised he even got in the armed forces with that deformity. (laughs) How? How? Seems like it would be hard yeah. to, like, your thumb will keep slipping off your gun with the nail underneath. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, it was uh, Vietnam. Like, they needed soldiers. So. I know. By the way, I never had any of these G.I. Joe's. The original ones, yeah. yeah. I didn't. We were coming up to my brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hairy kung fu grips. Right. The ongoing situation in Vietnam and the growing anti-war sentiment of the late 60s signaled the end of the early years of G.I. Joe. The first G.I. Joe's are kind of, like... They look like elves on a shelf, kind of. They, they're very yeah. boyish. They're very, like, soft-looking. They don't look like yeah. tough guys, you know? Yeah. They look kind of like Ken's in, in, you know, yeah, yeah, in army clothes. Yeah. But then they got, with, they, with the scar and stuff, they got a little bit more. Yeah. Like, and they did the, the fuzzy hair and the beards and stuff. When, they, when that stuff came, yeah. then, yeah, then they were like, oh, It was full on, yeah. like, yeah, we're... They're, Bunch of dirty dozens. <laughs> By 1969, G.I. Joe was no longer a soldier, sailor, pilot, marine, but rather an adventurer. He was marketed under the... Adventures of G.I. Joe. The line consisted of... Adventurer, Black Adventurer, Aquanaut, and Talking Astronaut. Instead of military sets, the mostly recycled materials from earlier years were given names such as... Fight for Survival, Danger of the Depths. Mysterious Explosion, Secret Mission to Spy Island, and Mouth of Doom. <laughs> Mouth of Doom? Yes, what is really bad breath. What is... All right. You, ugh, you got a mouth of doom, buddy. You better brush them teeth. <laughs> uh, by the late 1960s, in the wake of the Vietnam War, Hasbro sought to downplay the war theme that initially defined G.I. Joe. Yeah, during this time, like a, a little bit after this time, mm-hmm. I remember having like these G.I. Joe... Uh, Read along records. Do you remember those? Did you ever have those? No. It was like no. it came with a book and a record, and you would put the record on, and I'm basically explaining read along records. Yeah, pretty much yeah. self-explanatory. But it would have a story, and it would have like sound effects. It was really like oh, an absorbing cool. kind yeah. of reading, whatever. Okay. And so these Joes, like I remember, they had like these cool jumpsuits, like different colored mm-hmm. jumpsuits with like silver belts and stuff. Oh. And like these white holes. They didn't look like. They were adventurers. They right, were like they right. weren't. I remember it wasn't like, you know, the other GI Joes, which were the right. 
army guys and the guys with actual the, military yeah, dudes, yeah, which yeah. were the first ones that I got. But these guys were more. They were the adventure team. Yeah, man. <laughs> Highlights of the line included Lifelike Flocked Hair and Beard, an innovation developed in England by a palatoy for their licensed version of Joe, Action Man. They all burn their draft cards, too, the adventurers. <laughs> it was weird. These were introduced in 1970. A retooled African-American adventure was also introduced, which came in two versions, as did the others in the series, Bearded or Shaven. Okay. <laughs> in 1974, named after the increasingly popular martial art, Hasbro introduced Kung Fu Grip to Ooh, the G.I. Joe line. The Kung Fu Grip, man. That, to this day, is still something. I, Everybody knows yeah. the Kung Fu Grip. It has nothing to do with Kung Fu. No. I mean, look, I'm not a Kung Fu master. I have never said I was a Kung Fu master, Adam. Yeah, uh, no one's ever accused you no, of being a kung fu never. master. If you would see me on the street, you wouldn't be like, that guy's a kung fu master. He, he knows kung fu. But I know there's no kung fu grip that you learn. I... The greatest thing was you would take the grip and you'd grip your other Joe and you'd flip him over and that would be <laughs> kung fu. Kung Fu, yeah. The, this was another innovation that had been developed in the UK for Action Man. The hands were molded into softer plastic that allowed the fingers to grip objects in a more lifelike fashion. Very cool. And they also came up with the hair, too, in Britain, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. yeah, all the innovations. Yeah, yeah. Those so the, Brits loved their do- ooh, they, action, figures. action figures. They did. The polymer used, however, broke down quickly, which caused the end of the thumb and fingertips to break off after a few weeks. Oh, and no deformed thumb this time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, how would you grip anybody with a deformed thumb? But they all had – they what they did, because, you know, they the, the hands would crumble. Right. They put a little thing in that during their adventures in certain parts of Africa, <laughs> these Joes got leprosy. They would get – oh, leprosy. Yeah, and oh, that's wow. why their fingers started falling Wow, off. that's sad. It was sad. It wasn't fun to play with your leprosy dolls <laughs> because then you'd have to go to the I'm leper sorry, colony. excuse me? You mean leprosy action oh, figures? leprosy action figures. <laughs> then there was like the, the G.I. Joe Adventure leprosy colony. No. And you just had these needles you would put in all of their backs as treatment. It was it really... Was, there was a, an accessory set called Night of the Lepers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was weird and sad. But it was the 70s. It was. Everything was weird and sad. <laughs> yes. And everything was... Avocado and orange. Yes. In 1976, G.I. Joe was given eagle eye vision, a movable eye mechanism to allow the toy to appear to be looking around when a lever on the back of the head was moved. Yeah, it was cool. It's weird. (laughs) This would be the last major innovation for the original line of 12-inch figures. For its first 10 years, G.I. Joe was a generic soldier adventurer with only the slightest hints of a team concept existing. In 1975, after a failed bid to purchase the toy rights to the $6 million man, Hasbro issued a bionic warrior figure, Mike Power Atomic Man. Mike Power Atomic Man. Hi, I'm Mike Power. (laughs) One million units of Mike Power Atomic Man were sold. (laughs) That's not bad. That is amazing. That's a lot of Mike (laughs) Power. I named Mike Power. I had the... I had yeah, the, the six million dollar man. Yeah, yeah, that was the coolest because you could look through its eye. Oh yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and yeah. it would, had a little uh, like little telescope. Eyesight. Oh yeah, so you could yeah. see like his special vision. That's yeah, yeah, holding. Yeah, and then remember. it had this thing where you like on his back go choo, 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 and it would lift lift up an engine. Oh wow! And then you could peel up his skin on his arm, oh. and there'd be like two little oh, the, microchip the things, things you could take yeah. out of his arm. And oh, same thing with his leg. Out. Yeah, oh, wow. you could take out these microchips. Oh, weird! Oh, uh, he was. I, that was my favorite. Ooh, Joe was dead after <laughs> after Steve Austin came out. Man. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, also added to the adventure team was a superhero Bullet Man. This character had recurring enemies: the Intruders, strongmen from another world. Yeah. <laughs> Comics included with figures at the time featured Eagle Eye Joe, Atomic Man, and Bullet Man operating together, and the adventure team finally became an actual team. Good, finally. They've been working on it so hard, man. They did, they did. And it took a lot of therapy, but they finally (laughs) became a team. (laughs) The original 12-inch G.I. Joe line ended in America in 1976. Yeah. They stopped selling it. Uh, yeah, my Uncle Ben had some of these, and I remember when I was growing up, the, he's the one that's like maybe 12 years older than me. Yeah. But he, I remember playing the fuzzy, he had the, the fuzzy beards and stuff, and I just thought it was so weird that they had the weird fuzzy hair. I loved my G.I. Joes, and my stepdad hated the fact that I played <laughs> with dolls. <laughs> They're not dolls, they action figures. But he would like... Would you always affect the New York accent? Oh, I would. And that would even drive him crazier. He's like, you were born in Boston, dummy. I'm kind of siding with your stepdad now. be regional. He would do stuff like, your Jeep floated. Your G.I. Joe big Jeep floated. So we would put a G.I. Joe in the Jeep, put it in the pool, and then he would make me shoot at it. Oh. With, uh, which, 
he didn't make me shoot at it. I really <laughs> liked it, but he was trying to train me to hate dolls. So right, he had me right. shoot at it. So he would do these things to try to make me not like the dolls. Right. Didn't work because I love my action figures. So one day I had this like really cool, uh, not a suitcase, but this really cool kind of like trunk kind of thing that um, I kept Dallas? all my Joes yeah. in. Yeah. You know, it was, and I had a good collection of Joes. Mm -hmm. I came home from school one day, and it was gone. And I went to the stepdad, where are my Joes? And he said, the dump. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he's like, you're too old to play with dolls. I think I was seven <laughs> or eight, six or seven at the time, because this was in the 70s. Yeah. This was before they got rid of them. I was so heartbroken, man. Yeah. And not just that. But I had a good collection. If those Joes were still around, yeah, you know, yeah. but that was just so mean. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, and then I was like, you know, luckily he didn't get my Steve Austin. I still had that one. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, when the Star Wars came out, he, there was nothing he could do. Right, right. You know, those well, action figures. At least they were small enough that, that, they, that it didn't look like I was playing dress up with them. I think with him, it was the whole dress they, up thing. They just looked a little, yeah, yeah. And I was really like, I also had these dolls called uh, Big Jim. The big okay. gym line. Okay. And the thing about them is they had these muscles <laughs> that you you would put this uh, this metallic like band around mm -hmm. his bicep. And when you flexed it, it would pop the band off because his muscles oh, were really flexed. Nice, nice. And he was he was like the Mego sized. He was like the medium oh, like size. A four inch kind of high. Well, yeah, yeah like a, a like six or seven, okay. I think. Okay. Uh, and then but my <laughs> we were playing with my big gyms with my mom and my sister, and my mom like put this rad outfit on one of the big gyms. And I was like, well, this one's mine now. <laughs> and so I was like, from a very young age, I was always into costumes and always into yeah, like, yeah. you know, aesthetics. Yeah. And so yeah. I think what really bothered the old man was how, you know, I was very particular about the outfits that my <laughs> action fingers wore. So I think the Star Wars was less disgusting to him because I couldn't you, you, change any right. outfits or whatever. They didn't you have know? clothes. Yeah. Oh, he was a toughie. It's funny that you still now, when playing video games, you still are very particular about oh, your outfits. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's the whole thing. <laughs> Customization. I love oh, yeah. it. That's all part of it. You know, it's really fun to... That's why I love Grand Theft Auto Online, because it's like having an action figure. It is. You know, you've got your guns and your accessories and I, your cars and your clothes. and GTA is the closest I've come to how I played with my G.I. Joes when I was growing up. That, and then, you know, I mean, we'll get into it next week, but you know, with the... The video games are Legos, too. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Again, just like playing with Legos. It's it's cool because you get to cheat. Like, I, yeah. I can't... I would love to, to buy a Lego Millennium Falcon and put it together yeah. and hang it in the room or something. But I can't justify spending $300 on a to <laughs> you know, Legos, but right. I can fly around in a Lego one for right. much less money. Right. You know, so it's a way for me to kind of cheat the system yeah. and still be able yeah. to play with toys without yeah. actually buying toys. Yeah. That's why I love video games. Yeah. In 1977, Hasbro released the Super Joe Adventure Team and took the battle between good and evil to the stars. Nice. The figures were scaled down to eight and a half inches, similar in size to Mego's superheroes line of action figures. Those are the other ones that I had. I had all those Migos, man. Yeah. yeah. I even... Uh, this is the one that you would love. I had all of the Planet of the Apes Migos nice. with yes. the action. The, the treehouse uh, house set playset. or whatever. Yeah. I yeah. think I've said this before, but my yeah. mom was all up night yeah. setting it up yeah. and had all the action figures set up on it. And it was ready to play. <laughs> I just got under the tree and just started playing. You're... F all the rest of the presents, baby. <laughs> I'm on the Planet of the Apes. Your mom was awesome. She still she is. She is awesome. My yes. mom is awesome. She is awesome. Sorry. <clears throat> that was an awesome thing for her to do. That's she always made things special. I'm going to tell you one quick story about my mom. And I might have told this before, so please bring Probably. It. But one of the really fun things that my sister and I always bring up with my mom is there used to be this Hostess commercial where this mom came out with a tray that had Hostess pies, Hostess Twinkies, and Ding Dongs on it. Mm -hmm. And she would come out and say, Hostess anyone? <laughs> and the kids would be like, me, me. And they would run up and right, the Hostess right. whatever. So somehow, I don't even know how we did it, but we convinced my mom to go out and buy the treats, yeah. put them all on a tray, walk through the door, open up the door. We had the door closed. We had the whole thing presented like it was a play. God. And she opened up the door and would say, hostess, anyone? And then we were like, yeah, yeah, us, we. 
It was just so much. That was what was great. She was always game <laughs> and so much fun. And she still is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the line of the Super Joe Adventure team was a hybrid of superhero and space action figures with new features incorporated such as battery-powered backpack lights and motorized accessories. Ooh. Yeah. The hero Super Joe characters, Super Joe Commander and Super Joe, had a one-two punch that could be activated by pressing panels on the figure's back. Uh, I don't know if it got confusing for them since they were Super Joe and Super Joe Commander. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Super Joe Commander was always in charge. <laughs> well, yeah. The majority of these figures used Kung Fu grip-style plastic in the joints and hands, but with age, the material degraded, leaving even unopened figures missing limbs and hands. Again, they could not cure the leprosy. <laughs> even was, for Super Joe. It was rampant. <laughs> super, they needed super uh, leprosy. They needed Dr. Joe to yeah, come they in. did. And, Super Joe Doctor? And give him yeah. uh, treatments. Uh, unlike the original G.I. Joe collection, the Super Joe collection was developed from the start with a play pattern of good versus evil. Super Joe Commander and the Adventure Team. Uh, man of action and adventure with their alien comrades. The Night Fighters, Luminos, and the Shield fight against the evil Gore, King of the Terrons. Terron, the beast from beyond, and his orange-eyed ally Darkon, the half-man, half-monster. The action figure was the same as the Super Joe Commander, but molded in a dark green plastic and with a different set of accessories. <laughs> right, exactly. He's uh, green! So he's, he's green. Bad. So he's bad. <laughs> well, he's dark green. That's, oh. that's mm-hmm. universally the evil color. As with the previous series, very, various accessory costume packs were sold for the Super Joe line, including several that were powered by the Commander's light vest via a jack to the battery pack. Yeah, I remember this. They were like, they had like these black, like, skin-tight suits. I Joes. don't remember these at all. I think I had this one. And they had this, like, chest uh, device that had a light on it that yeah. would light up. yeah. Yeah, I had this one. Most of the non-powered packs were updated versions of previous G.I. Joe packs, some of which were simply used the same accessories without scaling them down for the smaller figure. <laughs> Big-ass guns. It didn't really fit. <laughs> I was like, come on, lazies. <laughs> yeah. Super Joe was discontinued by the end of 1978. The same basic body molds were later used by a subsidiary of Hasbro to produce a line of action figures based on the TV series Space Academy. Yeah, and this was right about the time when uh, the Star Wars figures were hitting. Yes, and ch- yeah. they would change everything. Yeah, yeah. It was it was right it was around this time, yeah. A Real American Hero was brought about as a revival of the original 12-inch G.I. Joe brand of the 1960s and 1970s. After the 12-inch figure had been absent from toy shelves for a few years, G.I. Joe was introduced in a three-and-three-quarter-inch action figure format following the success of the Star Wars and Micronauts three-and-three-quarter-inch scale toy lines. Oh, did you ever have Micronauts? I did. I they had a couple. They were so yeah. cool. It was weird to me because I thought they were just like Star Wars knockoffs, so I wasn't as interested in them. But they were like all clear, and they had those chest plates. Yeah, and all those yeah. Weird, I mean, like, it was its own thing. Yeah. I just was young and was like, these are stupid. Oh, man, the Micronauts. I love the Micronauts. Yeah, they, there was a whole like comic book line and everything. Oh, it was like, awesome. They had like yeah. silver heads, and they had like there these were cool little weird. Hands, yeah. and, and you could take the hand, they had the wrist cuff, and the little hand moved around inside the cuff like a ball joint, yeah. but not like any other thing. And you could pop off the hands and, and yeah. switch hands yeah. like, oh, I want black hands on this guy. And right. That was the cool thing about it is you could switch all the parts on the dudes. Right. Oh, they were cool. I think I still have a Micronaut somewhere. I, I think the main reason that I wasn't as interested in Micronauts was because it just wasn't, it didn't have a movie or a TV show. Yeah. Like, it was, it wasn't. I think there might have been, it was based on like a Japanese line or something. I don't remember. I it, just know it was so but cool. all I know is that I loved Star Wars because of the movies. Yeah. Like, I knew what the movies were, so I wanted to play with the characters in the movies, and, and which would become very uh, indicative later with G.I. Joe and the Real American Hero. G.I. Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, genesis of the genesis of the toy line. The genesis of the toy line came about from a chance meeting in a men's room, according to Jim Shooter, then editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics. Jim Shooter. The president and CEO of Hasbro was at a charity event that Marvel's president was also at. They ended up in the men's room standing next to each other, peeing, and uh, I think that's how they met. They were talking about each other's respective businesses, and it came up that Hasbro wanted to reactivate the trademark on G.I. Joe, but they were trying to come up with a new approach. Uh, Marvel's guy uh, was like, well, we have the best creative people in the world. Let me bring in this editor-in-chief of mine, and we'll fix it for you. Prior to G.I. Joe's launch in 1982, Larry Hama was developing an idea for a new comic book called Fury Force, which he was hoping would be an ongoing series for Marvel Comics. Yeah, you know, he was on MASH. Yeah, Larry he was Hama. an actor, yeah. He yeah. was a lot of things. He was also a vet. He... 
also made Wolverine very popular. Really? Yeah. I want to say that he might have actually created I this is this, Comic book nerds are going to lambast me for this, but I'm pretty sure he had something to do with the or- originations of Wolverine. Nice. Well, he yeah. seems like a really cool dude. He had a lot of different yeah. Uh, he was fascinating. things going on. Yeah. The original premise had the son of S.H.I.E.L.D. director Nick Fury assembling a team of elite commandos to battle neo-Nazi terrorist Hydra. Shooter approached Hama about the Joe project due to Hama's military background, and the Fury concept was adapted for the project. Shooter suggested that to Hasbro that G.I. Joe should be the team name and that they should fight terrorists, while Archie Goodwin invented Cobra and the Cobra Commander. Everything else was created by Hama. Oh, yeah. Hasbro was initially uncertain about making villain toys, believing this would not sell. Uh, I think they wanted you. They wanted you to play kind of like you did. You would make your other toys the villains, yes. so you would attack your bar, your well, sister's Barbies, thing. or whatever. I mean, that, that, that's that was the natural yeah progression because you didn't have there was no bad guys. Yeah, it's not like they because who wants to buy a bunch of Nazi dolls or whatever for their? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's some people that would. Uh-huh, yeah, yay, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I get it. But it's like, but that, but Star Wars had the villain guys. Yeah, yeah, you, you had know? to because it, I mean, it was the movie that like was the first to. time that you really yeah. had you know good guys and bad guys to play off of, and yeah. you would get three or four stormtrooper figures, right? You know, to to even out. Or Besides. 120, like I did. Oh, that'd be so I'm just cool. Kidding. I didn't do that. But yeah, I mean, I would take over the whole room and make different yeah. planets. And oh, the old man would get so pissed because <laughs> I would use the receiver as like the the base, the the uh, like the Death Star before I got the Death Star mm-hmm. playset, and I would use the <laughs> I would use the like the equalizer things as elevators and the guys would be like oh, yeah. so I would change all the settings yeah. because they would be going up and down on these elevators oh man I would be pissed about that <laughs> yeah, well hey <laughs> bit of a good my imagination yeah uh, Marvel would also suggest the inclusion of female Joes in the toy line and to include them with the vehicles as Hasbro again worried they would not sell on the yeah, put the broads with the vehicles nobody's gonna buy them yeah <laughs> I bought a Princess Leia yeah you I mean know? I it, 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 yeah <laughs> It's one of those. I'm looking it's at like, her right now. It's. I think at the time, general consensus was kind of like, okay, well, girls don't want to play with this stuff. Boys were blue and girls were pink. Yeah, that's what it yeah. was. That's how it was. There was no, you know, exploring. I, I mean, it, your feelings and all that stuff. It was just boys play with boy stuff, girls play with was, girl stuff. That was the general consensus, and no one really bucked to that trend. I no, mean, nobody was fighting against it. It was just that's just what it was. And it was oppressive. Yeah, and yeah, I mean. Boys wanted to play with other stuff, and girls wanted to play with G.I. Joe's, sure. and they did, and good. But it's like there was such like, like a, a ridiculous, yeah. sexist BS with yeah. everything yeah. when it came to kids, you know? It permeated everything, yeah. Exactly. It was, it was awful. It was decided that the comic book series itself would be advertised on television first, as opposed to advertising the toys directly for the time being. At least they made... Uh, excuse me. At least they made the... The female characters, soldiers and stuff, instead of like, yeah. she's the nurse she's and the, the G.I. Joe secretary. And she's the cook. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and she comes with her own action right. vacuum. Action pots and pans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this was uh, because television advertising for toys were subject to strict regulations, such as how long an advertisement could depict a toy in animation. Well, the good old days when they actually cared about yeah. children's brains. Well, the regulations for literary creation were much more lax, allowing them to depict animation for the entire advertisement when they were advertising the comic book, but not the toys. So that was... Which doesn't make any sense at all. No, it doesn't. It's just a weird loophole, but it was brilliant. It was brilliant that they went in and had them create the comic book story because that creates an automatic play script. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I got to get these toys because I want to play this. Right. And by doing the comic book as the Trojan horse into the, (laughs) you know, Plastic Fantastic... Yeah. Uh, it was brilliant because you they could really push the comic book, but what they were really doing is pushing right. the toys. Toy. It was, right. It was right. brilliant. It was yeah, it was it was very good marketing. There's a lot of creativity in terms of production and marketing in, oh, yeah. Yeah. in, in the G.I. Joe story. It's that's what makes it so cool is right. all of these like little you know, it's just such a ra- it seems like such a ragtag kinda, <laughs> you know, dirty dozen kind of right. toy. It's pretty yeah. cool. Each G.I. Joe figure included a character biography called a file card. File card. You can cut them out. 
Yeah, Larry Hama was largely responsible for writing these file cards, especially for the first 10 years. When developing many of the characters, he drew much from his own experiences in the U.S. military. You know, can I tell you like a funny thing about Mm -hmm. the cards? So originally they were supposed to release the G.I. Joe line at an earlier date, but because of Empire Strikes Back and those toys, they decided to wait a year. Oh, yeah. And it was within that year that Hama wrote the cards. Like. So oh, all he wrote the, all the stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all the stuff wouldn't have come out if the toy originally came out when it came what, out. Right, but right. Because they had instead of just you know waiting for it to come out, they you know refined right, and right. and did stuff to to build up the toy in that year. So that's you know thank George Lucas for that. Yeah, well, yeah. The overall premise for the toy line revolves around an elite counter terrorist team codenamed GI Joe, whose main purpose is to defend human freedom against Cobra, a ruthless terrorist organization determined to rule the world. Yeah. Every year, Hasbro and Marvel would meet up to discuss the upcoming toys and marketing. Yeah, serious. Yeah, Larry Hama was given free reign by Marvel's editors. That must have been great. Both the toys and the comics would become a great success, the comics being Marvel Comics' most subscribed title at one point. But Jim Shooter has said sister company Marvel Productions, who handled the cartoon, overspent on production and had a critical success but a financial disaster with the show. Yeah. Yeah. The first 11 characters were introduced in carded packs while four others were bundled with vehicles. <laughs> yeah, all the, uh, the also-rans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first series of action figures had straight arms with elbow joints. While it was common for many characters to share the same mold for producing a body part, it was much more noticeable in the first year. As for the original 13 G.I. Joe figure, only six head molds were created. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. It gets worse. Three unique molds were assigned to Stalker, Snake Eyes, and Scarlet, while the other ten characters utilized one of three generic heads. Also, they stripped Snake Eyes of all of his body accessories because they they needed to cut down costs. So instead of... uh, you know, taking little pieces off of each character, they just stripped down Snake Eyes yeah. and made him, you know, completely barren of all accessories. And he also and that led to, like, the most popular character right, of all. Right, Despite these limitations, the new toy line was an extreme success. With the success of the first line of toys, Hasbro expanded the line the next year with new characters and more original body part designs. In 1983, Swivel Arm Battle Grip. Articulation and some extra tweaks were added to the new characters and the existing figures in order to make them more poseable. <laughs> these guys that came up with Kung Fu Grip and Swivel Arm Battle Grip, these guys were great. Yeah, I, I distinctly remember having Joe's before where the arm would do that weird swivel thing. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I'd... Well, this is, I think I told you this. When the new Joe's came out, I had, I was about 13, I think. And I had recently had to give up my toys, you know, because I think around 12 is about when you have to start, you know, 12, 13, you got to start acting, you know, you kind of think about girls and your friends pressuring you to give up your toys and blah, blah, blah. And my friend Phil, his brother Chuck was younger than us, and he started getting all the the toys. I would always go over to Phil's and be like, huh, what's up, what's up Chuck? What, what'd, you, what'd you get? Oh, and I'd just be like fascinated by his G.I. Joe's. Yeah, just yeah. Like, Checking them out. Just jelly that I couldn't play. <laughs> in 1985, the base of the action figure's heads were given a ball joint, which gave the figure's heads the ability to look up and down. Yeah. It was really good for battle because oh, Cobra yeah. would just come get the high ground. They would, or they would just crawl on their bellies. <laughs> yeah. And they would be like, what's going on? What's going on? How does the enemy keep killing us? <laughs> The years from 1983 to 85 were considered are considered by many to be the golden years of G.I. Joe, a real American hero, as many of the most popular characters were introduced around this time. Vehicles and playsets became bigger and seemed to top the design of the previous year, culminating in 1985's impressive USS Flag playset, an aircraft carrier that measured seven and a half feet long. It was insane. And not to mention that spaceship shuttle yeah, thing that was yeah. humongoid too that was like the size of a giant backpack or something and then this thing said i mean nobody I, had this i distinctly remember seeing this in the store and being like what the hell did you want it <laughs> no there is no way it was how would you play with it like it didn't make any sense to it me it was a huge place that you put Not to mention where the hell it? was i going to put it uh, yeah you needed a big house you needed a room a room, <laughs> literally a room. Yeah, not a lot of people got that because it was also over a hundred dollars, which it is yeah. a lot of for a toy back then. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, like I think like the Millennium Falcon was like forty bucks, and I think the the What's Death Star that? PlayStation. I yeah, I think it was. It was like forty or fifty bucks because I remember it being like because I wanted that bad. Like the Death I waited. Star set. I, I just have Millennium Falcon. I, anyway, I, I think those yeah. were about fifty. I don't. I don't think they were that expensive, but I. But yeah. 
It was also late seventies, so I don't know. I mean, oh well, yeah. yeah. I would just I just remember seeing the Millennium Falcon in a catalog before it came out and just obsessing over that thing until it came <laughs> out. And then I saw it on the shelves and I was like, Mom! And she was like, great. Because my stepdad was there. Oh, and yeah. And she was like, great, get it later. And then, because he couldn't know. <laughs> and so I was just like dying inside, knowing that it was out and I needed it. Right. Needed right. it so bad. Had to have oh, it. Oh, my God. I love that thing so much. That was my favorite toy, I think. Oh, yeah. It was my Millennium yeah. Falcon with my. On Chewy. Right, right. Oh, a lot of adventures. <laughs> Hasbro would continue to expand the toy line to the point of oversaturation. At one point, they had 250 different characters. That's a lot. Yeah, and and on top of that, God knows how many accessories and vehicles and things. Well, that's the thing, man. This was an expensive yeah. toy for your kids with all the well, play sets. Well, because that's, that's the thing, is that they, they've gone on record saying that the... Uh, the actual characters were loss leaders because it would convince them they would lose money on those. It would convince them to buy the vehicles, which is where they actually made money. That's where the money is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they would be charging. It would probably cost maybe twice as much to make the fic vehicle as it does the character. Right. And yet they would charge 50 bucks for it. Oh, yeah. You know? They also, I mean, like... there was a lot of cool... You know, like the hovercraft had depth charges. Yeah, I mean, and... they were they were fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there was a lot of innovation, and, and they were definitely worth the money. But, you know, it, it makes sense. There was a noticeable drop of sale in sales in 1989. The lackluster performance convinced Hasbro to scale back on production. They concentrated on the action figure lineup and reduced the number of new vehicles for that year. Uh, the characters from the Street Fighter II video game became part of the G.I. Joe lineup in 1993. as. Has... <laughs> Hasbro bought the toy rights to the characters. It's around that time. It's like in TV shows when they suddenly there's another kid pops up. <laughs> yeah. Cousin Oliver. When you start pulling in random other brands, it's yeah. like, mm, you're on Ooh. your last legs there. How did they get here? <laughs> He's like, Transported by a video game into the G.I. Joe world. Well, you've got really long arms. That's cool. <laughs> Although the line would officially end in 1994, design elements of the G.I. Joe figures and vehicles would continue in later toy lines, such as a line based on the Street Fighter motion picture, as well as another based on the game's equally popular competitor, Mortal Kombat. A lot of these toys, these art, more, like these articulated toys and stuff, mm -hmm. what held them together was just a rubber band. Yeah. So they didn't like you, like oh, our yeah. like our little buddy up here, Buck Rogers. Yeah. You know, yeah. He is cleaved in half because his rubber band popped and so he's got three parts right right but that's the thing that sucks about those it's hard to keep those oh yeah i mean the, the bands will get old yeah and they will crack and, and they'll break yeah. and, that's and there's it. really no way to restore it that's yeah. the one thing about the star wars figures because they were you know hard plastic they they're they right, right. i mean you can look at these guys they they're oh yeah over 40 years I mean, old and they look the boba fett looks brand new yeah yeah same thing with melando He's looking pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, another example of how I think the sales were flagging and, and how they were trying to bring bring back sales was in 1991, Hasbro brought back the 12-inch figures branded as the Hall of Fame, which they produced right. for three years. Well, this was the beginning, too, of like the collectors. Yeah. Because yeah. Star Wars stuff was old enough now that people were collecting them. It was at least 20-something yeah. years old. Because it was like the late 80s when yeah. the Star Wars collection really took off. So that it made sense to, to do... You know, nostalgia stuff like that. But also, you have to realize in the 90s, you know, we're going from the rah rah Reagan years to the, you know, Clinton years, which was not <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. you know, it was well, less military. You know, yeah, we had yeah. our first president who dodged the draft, you know, right, if you want right. you know, whatever. I mean, he, he didn't. He was, he was the antithesis of Reagan, yeah. Exactly. He yeah. was. And, uh, you know, for good. But, uh, but yeah, so there was a different climate within, you know, things were changing. No, definitely, definitely. In 1995, Hasbro released the classic collection of the 12-inch figures. They sold them until 2004. G.I. Janes were reintroduced, the first female 12-inch figures in the line since 1967. Was that, did that coincide with the G.I. Jane movie? Um, that was in the early 90s, wasn't it? It was around that time. It's possible. Probably. It would make sense. I want to say it was in 95 or 96 when that came out. Yeah. For the 15th anniversary of the Real American Hero 3 and 3 quarter inch line, Hasbro released a line exclusive to Toys R Us. Uh, Hasbro re-released the 3 and 3 quarter inch figures for the 25th anniversary in 2007, a new series of figures for the 30th anniversary in 2011, and a new line for the 50th anniversary of the original G.I. Joe line in 2014. Yeah, look, now it's just everywhere. You yeah. know, people are... 
I watch uh, I watch a lot of YouTubes, and yeah. uh, you know the, the the action figure collector thing oh, yeah. is so insane. And, it's, it's 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 its own little market. Yeah, and you know there's these new companies too that are that are making licensed stuff mm. uh, like Hot Toys. You know, I'm sure Hot Toys has probably done a GI Joe, sure. you know, or I'm something sure. to that effect. Yeah. So it's like the market for nostalgia and and for toys is huge right oh, now. Oh yeah, yeah. Especially action figures. That is correct. In 2020, Hasbro released a new line of super articulated figures and vehicles similar to the Star Wars The Vintage Collection, utilizing retro-themed packaging from the 1980s. There have been countless comics, movies, TV shows, TV movies, and video games. G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra was released in 2009, directed by Stephen Summers, starring Channing Tatum, Christopher Eccleston, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Oh, bad. Except for George Go- Joseph Gordon, Joe Golo, Joe Golo. was having a good time being, he was the Cobra Commander. Yeah. It, was, it was like he was doing a Richard Dreyfuss impersonation. I am the co- and they should have Dreyfuss. <laughs> I'm the Cobra Commander. I'm going to get you sharks. It was weird. I, the movie was, was just bad. weird. It was not good, but I did like Joe Golo. As uh, yeah, as the Cobra Commander, poor, uh, poor Channing Tatum. He was just he a did what himbo. he could. Yeah, there was nothing he could. he could do. I mean, it just they didn't wasn't, give him any. It wasn't written very well. <laughs> no, and he's Channing Tatum is a comedic actor. I mean, he's got the bod and the looks of a, yeah. and he can do action man or whatever. Sure, sure. But he's so much better at comedy. Like I just watched Bullet Train. Oh yeah, and he does like a cameo in there. Oh, does he? And he's freaking hilarious. Like, I just, he's so likable and funny. Right, I just, right. it's just, he's not, it's like uh, Chris Pratt, you know? It's like when you take all the humor and stuff out of him, it's just, you know, it's yeah. just another bland action guy. Right, 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 right. Great apes. <laughs> After Variety had reported that G.I. Joe became a Brussels-based outfit that stands for Global Integrated Joint Operating <laughs> Entity. Oh, Joe's gone woke! Go woke, go broke! There were reports of out- outrages over Paramount's alleged attempt to change the origin of G.I. Joe team. Hasbro responded on its G.I. Joe website, claiming it was not changing what the G.I. Joe brand is about, and the name G.I. Joe will always be synonymous with bravery and heroism. Oh, yes, these make-believe toys, these make-believe stories about these make-believe plastic yeah. dolls. Oh, don't uh, mess with the stories. Again, this is the fans, man, the fans. I hate fans. Toxic fandom is, I, I don't get it. Like, look, I love Star Wars. I didn't love the new movies, but they didn't ruin my childhood. Sure. You know, I still found something to enjoy about them. Yeah. You know, it's just like, if you love something... Let it evolve. Let other people have a chance. You know, maybe sure. it works. Maybe it doesn't. It doesn't erase I, everything. I I will bring up this exact <laughs> conversation when they recast Indiana Jones. I know they probably will, but <laughs> you know that doesn't mean I have to watch it. it no, does, look, no, I didn't particularly like or dislike the new Han Solo movie. I just thought it was pointless. It didn't do sure. anything to help the character. Like, if they do an Indiana Jones movie and they pick a great actor to if take the mantle. done well. And it's done well, I'll sure. enjoy it, you know? Sure. It's, it's, but, you know, he said the character dies with him. And I think it's, it's not James Bond, you know? It's not yeah. a, a character yeah. that's been played by a bunch of people for I think 50 it, years. I think it could have been. It could have been, but he... But now it's not. Yeah. He's owned this character for 40 Once years. Once they did Crystal Skull, that was out the window. Yeah, and I think... You know, I think if they want to give, <laughs> I know it's such speed bump, but I know if they want to give uh, Bridger, Phoebe uh, Waller Bridgers, Bridgers, I don't know what the hell. Phoebe Waller Bridgers. Thank you. I have so much trouble with these three named actors. Waller Bridger Phoebe. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they want to give her a new series with a new character, that's great. Sure. You know, I mean, that might be what they're doing. I, I we'll see. I mean, the movie will come out. And I, I, you know. I've heard that that they're doing a, another like young Indiana Jones yeah. series, and that's fine. I say. Do it animated. And yeah. get a guy that sounds like Harrison Ford. Sure. You know. God, yeah, they've been doing that with Star Wars for a long time. Yeah, Lego Star Wars and all that stuff. I yeah. mean, you know, it's, it's. I don't know. I I don't know how we got on this with G.I. Joe. It was Joe, me. It was me. But uh, <laughs> Sorry. I was, it was just because of toxic fandom. That's all. I, yes, yes. But I look, I, 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 I'm not going to start writing comments and dissertations is, about how I hate th- Star yes. Wars now or, or, you know, it's like... It's, this is what kills me, is that people like this, it's like the new movie's coming out and they've changed everything. Okay. It didn't take away your cartoons. No. It didn't take away your action figures. No. It didn't. It's not like the police came in and rounded everything up and said, this is what it is now. Nothing can ruin your childhood except for you yes. and your stepdad. <laughs> 
sending your toys to the dump. <laughs> yeah. I, anyway, uh, they they were very much about the movie that Hasbro was saying it was to be a modern retelling of the G.I. Joe versus Cobra storyline based out of the pit as they were throughout the 1980s comic book series. I mean, there's so they, much there. It's, it's crazy that they didn't have one already. I, well, that's what I don't know why it took till 2009 for them to release the movie. Probably some rights issue where they probably had it in development forever. Uh, probably different writers. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing any movie ever gets made ever. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> a sequel followed in 2013, G.I. Joe Retaliation, adding in stars Dwayne Johnson, Ray Stevenson, and Bruce Willis. Didn't make it any better. Nope. Didn't make <laughs> fact, it any better. It got worse. Made it a little worse, yes. <laughs> A third movie was announced shortly after the release of Retaliation, but has been slow to develop. Uh, a reboot of sorts was released in 2021, Snake Eyes, G.I. Joe Origins. Whatever happened to that? Did it come out? It did. In well, 20, it was supposed to come out in 2020, and then the pandemic happened, and it came out in 2021. And it, I don't know if it's on any streaming services. Yeah. I, I've never seen it. I had no idea that movie came out. I want to say I think I might have scrolled past it on Tubi at one point. So Maybe. I, uh, when you're on a plane. And that's very possible. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It could be interesting. I'd, it has no actors I've ever heard of uh, from what I saw. I've never heard of the writer. I've never heard of the director. But you heard of Snake Eyes. I've heard of Snake Eyes. That is true. Uh, overall, the three films have grossed $705 million. It's so sad. There's just like, it's just sad. I mean, the th- fact is, is that if they would just do these better, they would make so much money. It's And it doesn't take a lot to make them better. It takes some no. humor, a little bit of character development. Look at the Marvel movies. You yeah. know, they do a good job of, of balancing out a huge chunk of people yeah. and making it good. Yeah. Interesting. You I know? mean, it's, it's, like, a, it's a huge, unwieldy beast, and they still manage to make it entertaining. And, yeah. And, there's a, and look, fun. And there's a lot of really good source material. The actual comics are great. Uh, a really good, to me... The 1987 TV animated movie yeah. was better than all of the live action movies. I got to check that out. I don't remember. It that. is. It, Don Johnson's in it. Well, I must <laughs> it have is seen amazing. it. Amazing. Must have seen it because I was a huge Don Johnson fan, and I, I, I still to this day watch cartoons. Yeah. I mean, if they had Saturday morning cartoons, I would watch them. I even try to like watch animated things on Saturday, on Saturday morning. morning. <laughs> nice. You know, nice. just to kind of you know yeah. get back into the childhood groove. But yeah, I mean, there's. Eh, I get, like, it, it could have been really cool because Bruce Willis is totally perfect for yeah. playing, yeah. you know, Hawk or whatever the guy's name is, General G.I. Joe. I don't know. I don't know which character he played. But he was like Duke, right? I think Duke. he played Duke, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And Duke was like right. the guy. Duke the blonde, was the head you know? guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so he's a good pick for Duke, you know? And there's yeah. some good. Yeah. It's just they don't. It, it's these type of movies that just get decided by committee. Yeah. And the execs. Get way too involved, and hey guys, yeah, Bob. Hey. hey Bob. Hey, yeah. I just want to let you guys know that um, I was part of the GI Joe team, and uh, my suggestion was just um, let's just get rid of the action. <laughs> let's get rid of the action. Let's get rid of the relationships, and let's just make it like a bunch of dolls around screen. A bunch of pictures of dolls yeah. on the screen. Yeah, they were like cool. Did they run with that? They did. Oh, all right. Yeah, it was awful. All right, thanks. Thanks for stopping about, by. About as awful as, as as I am as a father. Hey, I think your kids are playing with dolls. Uh, uh, do- okay, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> well, thanks for stopping He's by. Old school. Bob. Yeah, uh, I I think the big thing for me is that with those live movies, none of them were better than the stories I came up with. No, and so, they were yeah. bloated and convoluted yeah. and silly, and they just didn't make sense. It's just they put too much crap into these movies. It's like, you know, what a bit of great GI Joe movie. Falcon and the Winter Soldier, or what is that? Uh, uh, Winter Soldier, or Winter? Yeah, the Captain America Winter Soldier. Captain America yeah. Winter Soldier. That is a GI Joe movie. Yeah, I mean, you know? really, the Captain America storyline that that like uh, section of sure. the Marvel universe is really the closest you can come to GI Joe. Right, and, and Marvel did GI Joe comics, so yeah. it's like you know Makes they sense. could even fold GI Joe into Marvel if they, they wanted could. to, and they make could. it a, a you know pick five great characters and make them the GI Joe team and bring them in to help. Yeah, you know? I mean, they could do TV shows and all this. I mean, they could do a ton of stuff. Yeah. Like, give us the product. Let's <laughs> listen to us. we got eight pitches. So there were a total of six animated TV shows in addition to the animated TV movie we already talked about. They were 
G.I. Joe, a real American hero from 1983 to 1986. G.I. Joe, a real American hero from 1989 to 1992. G.I. Joe Extreme, animated series which ran from 1995 to 1997. G.I. Joe Sigma 6, 2005 animated series. G.I. Joe Resolute, 2009. And G.I. Joe Renegades in 2010. Yeah, that was when they were really... I remember when the Sigma 6 line came out, because I was uh, a friend of mine would always go to Toys R Us, kind of like with the DVDs and oh. stuff. He would go like every Thursday or Friday in the morning oh. and like grab figures and He was stuff. an adult collector? Oh, yeah. Nice. Uh, but I remember I would go with him quite a bit. We'd work at Warner Brothers together, mm-hmm. and I'd go with him before we'd go to work. And, uh, and man, yeah, the Sigma 6, all that stuff, I was just like, why? Why? Because he wouldn't... He it literally, he had an entire closet that was just full of carded action figures. That's crazy. I was like, you don't even look at them. They just get stuffed in a closet. Yeah, I guess it's his retirement plan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, six video games have been released. Uh, G.I. Joe Cobra Strike in 1983 by Parker Brothers for the Atari 2600 and Intellivision. I remember that. Uh, G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, the video game, uh, 1985 by Epix for the Apple II and the Commodore 64. Don't think I had that. I This is the thing. I don't know which one it was, and I looked at footage of both of these because mm-hmm. uh, there are playthroughs on YouTube. You can watch gameplay. I had a friend, my friend Chris Perillo, who I was friends with the whole family. Ben was the, the one I was closest to, but he was huge into like computers at a very young age. Nice. And it still is. He makes a ton of money off of, of doing computer stuff. Um, but he had a G.I. Joe game, and I loved it. I loved playing it. I think it was the one from Epics in 85, because I think it was a Commodore 64 we were playing it on. Nice. But watching the footage, I was like, this I don't. This doesn't look anything like I remember. No, no. <laughs> I, you know. Well, it's like, I mean, I, I used to love Ultima and Ultima 2. Yeah. And in my mind, it was a really awesome game. Right. But looking at it, it was... <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple. Uh, in 1991, there was the G.I. Joe, the NES by Taxon. Uh, in 1992, G.I. Joe, the arcade game by Konami. That was kind of like, uh, that was just basically a Contra ripoff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, G.I. Joe, the Atlantis Factor, also in 1992 by Capcom for the Nintendo Entertainment System. The Atlantis Factor. Joe, we're going underwater. G.I. Joe, the Rise of Cobra, the video game in 2009 by EA based on the movie. I haven't played any of those. Didn't play that at all. Uh, And that's it. That's been it for the video games, which is also surprising. It is weird. You'd think that there would be way more video games. Now, they should do, like, they should do a a G.I. Joe video game where it takes place in their toys. You know, like a small soldiers type of deal. Like the Hot Wheels Unleashed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you can, like, play, you know, there's the kitchen battles, there's the backyard battle, you know, and you have access to all the play sets and the, you know, the different vehicles, but you have to go get be, them out yeah. of the box or something. I don't know. It would be really <laughs> that would be, fun. That would be cool. Yeah. yeah. I would totally buy that video game. G.I. Joe. And was, you could have uh, the big Kung Fu grip G.I. Joes come in and like, oh, the big, t- like the big 12 monster. inch ones. Yeah, so you like unlock them. G.I. Yeah. <laughs> Joe was inducted into the National Toy Hall of Fame at the Strong in Rochester, New York in 2004 and into the Pop Culture Hall of Fame in 2017. Again, it seems weird that it would take so long. I, yeah, I mean, well, I don't. I think the National Toy Hall of Fame has not been around. I don't think it was around much before that. Um, but yeah, it, it's they're huge. I mean, like like I said at the beginning, at one point they had over two billion dollars in sales in one year. Like it's it's crazy how insanely popular these were. Well, and also your grandpa, your dad, and you could have all played yeah. with GI Joes, different eras, different types. Yeah, yeah, you it's know, very true. you. Still can play with brand new G.I. Joes today, 60 years later. Yeah. And uh, that's a pretty good test of time. Like all these toys that we were coming up with that we're telling their story this month, they all have longevity. Yeah. And, str- yeah. and, and I get, I mean, some it doesn't make any sense. Nerf is crazy to me. <laughs> Nerf that's 60 years old and keeps evolving is crazy to me, but just fascinating and awesome. You know, it fulfills a need you didn't know you had, Jim. <laughs> but but you know, Hot Wheels and GI Joe totally makes sense because yeah. yeah. you know kids love cars and kids love war. We're, we're you know, like culture. playing yeah. army. We're a car and military culture. Yes, for sure. I love a toy that spans generations mm-hmm. and evolves and adapts and yes. becomes something yes. new. And and, and GI Joe definitely did. Yeah, that. and yeah. GI Joe has a great story to tell, and I think I think we need the video game we talked about. Yeah. Because I think yeah. that, I want to play it. 
And I think we'd need an animated, new animated series yeah. or movie yeah. that's still fun. The, the one thing that I thought was kind of interesting is uh, Hama, who was a vet, mm-hmm. when the series came out, he thought it was morally bankrupt because nobody died. Right, right. Because in the comics, people died. Yes, and you and he was like, "How can you have a right. war-based right. toy I, where nobody dies?" I always, when I was growing up and watching oh, yeah, it, I always was like, "What? Everybody's shooting at everybody, and no one's getting hit." Yeah, the plane blows up, and then the two parachutes come yeah, down, yeah. you know, and the car blows up, and then and this was everything back then. Like you know, you watched yeah. a team, and the car would blow up and roll seventy-five times, and guys would get out and be like, ooh, kind of a little ooh. wobbly, and like, "Oh, wow, that was crazy." Nobody, you know. You couldn't, yeah. It was much more restricted. When they started actually killing people in cartoons and stuff, it was shocking and awesome yeah. because it gave it a sense of realism and drama that you didn't have. There were no stakes in the old G.I. No, Joe. They were no. fun adventure shows, but you knew nobody was going to die, good or bad. Well, you and know? that's that's what I loved about the TV movie because in the one in 87, which I think was proof of concept for the later show that mm-hmm. came out in 89, but it was way higher. Like, I believe some, at least one Joe died. During, Maybe. During yeah, because they did. It was probably PG. I, they, yeah, yeah. You know. I mean, and they eventually broke it up and showed it on TV. Yeah. But like, I mean, it was on TV anyway, but I remember when it premiered. But like, yeah. but it was definitely higher stakes. Yeah. But the, the Co- Cobra is the only organization that are worse shots than Stormtroopers. <laughs> That's, true. That's there, true. I remember seeing a shot and there's just... Thousand because it was always like these laser bolts, yeah, in the Joe. You know, they yeah. weren't like real bullets, oh, no, they were because you like had these, to see them, yeah. yeah. Do, 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 do. And just the screen is filled with these green, <laughs> it's like a video game. Like, a a of... You're bouncing off everything yeah. except for the two Joes, yeah, they're just, just they're there. Them completely, yep. And then they're just like <laughs> pew, pew, with their little stun guns, beep, beep, and then they're and they gone. would pop them out and they'd be done. And then they'd show like a little, like thing over their head, you know, swirly, well, swirly to show start, that they're knocked yeah. out and yeah. not, yeah. you know, dead. Not dead, yeah. Well, the the, the third sequel is happening still, uh, the third live action movie. Uh, they It's still in development, so well, it's very possible it'll come out in the next couple of years. Well, let's hope that they give it to a cool filmmaker yeah. who loves yeah. the toy and wants to tell a fun story. Yes. And, you know, I, I still think it should be maybe animated. I think... I think you need to hit the toy part and not make it a military right. thing. I think the problem with the G.I. Joe movies is they made it too military and tried to make it. There was a a weird tone to it because mm-hmm. it was fantastical with the costumes and the vehicles and the being able right. to run, you know, yeah. a million yeah. miles an hour. And I think you had one of the Wayans brothers was in it or somebody to be the, God, to be the comic right. relief. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you can't take it so seriously. And they took it way too seriously yeah. in tone. And I think you have to have fun with it mm-hmm. and, and and lean into how wacky it was and make yeah. it like an 80s movie. You yeah. got to, I mean, yeah. let's put it in that era, you know, and have that fun right. time of like, oh, here's this ragtag group of, <laughs> you know, warriors in the 80s that President Reagan is calling upon. Right. We need Joe. You know, it's like <laughs> you could have so much fun with it. And that's the thing. That with these kind of things, with these toys and stuff, you don't make a gritty retelling of war. Yeah, yeah. You have a big, goofy, fun, costumey thing to to have the joy of the toy. If you're gonna yeah, make a TV, yeah. if you're gonna make a show or a or a movie about it, you have to have the joy of the toy. I think a lot of it with the first movie was it was around the time when Christopher Nolan had his first Batman movie come out, and everybody wanted to make things more real and gritty and dark and like. Yeah. And it just doesn't work for G.I. Joe. Just, no, no, because Joe is fun. And, yeah. I mean, all the characters are weird and wacky and colorful. Yeah, it's bright colors. Yeah, like it's, and it's just you could have so much fun with it. I mean, if you did like a, you know, if you did like a hybrid comedy adventure, yeah. you know, and and you didn't, the, the Joes weren't in on the joke, but the audience is in on the joke. Right. You're going right. to have a lot of fun. And you could still yeah. have you know, a, a great action adventure movie. Yeah. yeah. But just don't take yourself so damn seriously. Yeah. And have yeah. fun with the fact that all the Cobra people are bad shots. And, you yeah, know, have yeah, fun exactly. with the fact that it's like we're at war, but nobody dies. You know, I think so often that, like you said, people are looking to create something within the moment of, yeah. of what's yeah. going on in cinema rather than embracing the joy and the fun of what 
what they're making a movie about. Right. And if you're making, you're not making, a, if you make a G.I. Joe Vietnam movie, well, that's no fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, Joe, Diddy Mao, you know, playing Russian roulette. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know how I got my scar? <laughs> you know, we don't want that. No, we don't need no, it. No, no, Have some fun. Give us a fun Joe movie because we love G.I. Joe. Yeah. Thanks for listening. We're out of time. Uh, we'll be back next week with some of Lego. Oh, baby. Lego. Yeah. Move, move the diametrically opposite of G.I. Joe, which is to build things. Yes. And not... with Lego and construct. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be back. Go, Joe. Fight against the evil Gore King. Of the terror. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hold on. This is a toughie. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. What's happening? Already in progress. <laughs>